Did you know that 85% of all human beings have a monkey gene? The monkey gene is called the rhesus factor, or RH factor, because it can be traced to the rhesus monkey. Chances are your blood type tests RH positive, which means you've got the monkey gene. If by chance your blood type tests negative for the monkey gene, you are in a small minority of only 15% of the world's population. So what happens when an RH negative woman gets pregnant with an RH positive partner? Her body rejects, attacks, and kills the fetus, unless, of course, there's medical intervention. What is the cause of this strange breeding incompatibility within the human species? Are RH negative people alien in some way? <laughs> Studies were done to see if there's any difference between RH negative people and RH positive people. The results were shocking. RH negative people commonly have a higher than average IQ, sensitive vision, a lower body temperature, psychic abilities, increased sensitivity to heat and sunlight, and a capacity to stop watches and disrupt electrical appliances. They can't receive blood transfusions from RH positive donors, and they can't be cloned. They often have reddish hair and blue, green, or hazel eyes. RH negative people report a feeling of not belonging to the human race. Some even have an extra vertebrae or an extra rib or a caudal appendage, otherwise known as a tail. Since RH negative blood hasn't followed the usual evolutionary path, it must have been introduced from some outside source. Two celebrated authors, Eric von Daniken and Zachariah Stitchen, have uncovered convincing evidence that the outside source was ancient astronauts who genetically engineered the human race. According to Van Daniken, the proof lies in the breathtaking megaliths that were developed either by extraterrestrial visitors or by humans who had been taught the advanced scientific knowledge needed to build them. Such artifacts include Stonehenge, the head statues of Easter Island, and the Egyptian pyramids and obelisks. Why did so many ancient cultures with no way of communicating with each other worship these so-called gods and illustrate them in their artwork as astronauts with space vehicles? It's easy to imagine our own astronauts someday encountering intelligent life forms in space who will view us as their gods. On a clear summer's night, when we look up into the diamond-studded heavens, we can't help but contemplate the big questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? The most popular theories about where we came from are evolutionism and creationism. Evolutionists believe that early primates evolved into the missing link, which evolved into Cro-Magnon man, which evolved into us, the Homo sapiens. The big problem with that theory is this. No remains for the missing link have been found. No tools, no fossils, and no artwork. Creationists believe that the human race was created by God, which means that God genetically engineered us. Most believers would agree that God is a being or an energy not of this planet or of this dimension. God must therefore be an alien. Many of the ancient texts talk of gods who came to earth from the heavens and created man in their own image. In the Bible's book of Genesis, the gods are described as giant beings called the Nephilim, or fallen ones. The Egyptians, Phoenicians, Chaldeans, Mayans, Aztecs, Aryans, Assyrians, and the inhabitants of ancient Indian Tibet have all recorded the arrival of gods from the heavens in their ancient writings. Endless accounts from ancient cultures describe a serpent race. The Bible introduces the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Indian scriptures speak of a reptilian race, while East Asian writings mention a dragon race and a reptilian humanoid race. Middle Eastern religions describe reptilian-like demons, and African shamans speak of the Shatori, which is also a reptilian race. The best place to get answers about who these gods were is from the oldest known records written by the oldest known civilization, the Sumerians, whose culture dates back to 6000 BC. 
the Sumerians documented the arrival of gods from another world who brought with them advanced knowledge. They called these gods the Anunnaki, which means those who from heaven to earth came. In the 1800s, Sumerian clay tablets were found in present-day Iraq. The tablets clearly identify the name of the god who genetically engineered the human race. His name was Enki, and he's the same god that the Greeks called Poseidon. Enki was a serpent god, and his symbol was two entwined serpents. The entwined serpents are the double helix of human DNA. This same symbol is used by today's medical profession. Why on earth would the Sumerians and other ancient civilizations make up the same lies about our human origins? The real question that needs answering is why the corporate religions of the world have hidden the truth from us. Zechariah Stitchin is convinced that ancient astronauts lived among the Sumerians. We look like them, says Stitchin. They made us through genetic engineering. They jumped the gun on evolution and made us look like them physically and to be like them emotionally. Stitchin goes one step further. He suggests that these gods or ancient astronauts interbred with the human females they created. The Bible's book of Genesis agrees. In Genesis 6, 1 to 4, it says, And it came to pass when humans began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they chose wives, and they had children with them. What planet, galaxy, universe, or dimension did these sons of God who seeded human life on earth come from? The first and most obvious place to start looking is right here in our own solar system, starting with our closest neighbor, Venus. It's the brightest planet in the night sky, and we can see it with our own eyes for three hours before sunrise and three hours after sunset. Venus is called the morning star. The fallen angel Lucifer is also called the morning star. Is there any connection between Lucifer and the planet Venus? When ancient astronauts mapped and recorded the movements of Venus in the night sky, they discovered that every eight years, the planet traced a nearly perfect pentagram shape around the zodiac. The pentagram has long been associated with Lucifer, who is also known as Satan. High up in the Andes Mountains, ancient hieroglyphs were discovered on the Inca Temple of the Sun in Lake Titicaca. The hieroglyphs reveal that a golden spaceship from Venus landed there in the dawn of time, bringing what the ancients called gods from outer space. The Sumerians also named the planet where the gods had come from. They called it Nibiru, which means the planet of the crossing. There is only one planet of the crossing that visibly crosses between the Earth and the Sun, and that planet is our closest neighbor, Venus. Scientists believe that Venus once had fertile rolling hills, majestic mountains, sparkling oceans, and lush green valleys. It may well have been home to a technologically advanced civilization with an atmosphere similar to Earth until a cataclysmic greenhouse effect boiled away the water. As children, we learned in science class that the sun is 93 million miles away from Earth. Venus, on the other hand, swings by our planet at a distance of only 25 million miles. About 250,000 years ago, the orbital path of Venus came so close to Earth that the electromagnetic fields between Venus and Earth collided. The catastrophic collision shifted the orbital path of Venus and threw it into a reverse retrograde spin. Instead of spinning counterclockwise like Earth and other planets, Venus started spinning clockwise and rotating so slowly that a single day on Venus became and continues to be equal to 243 days on Earth. The cataclysm caused planet Earth to reverse its poles, and the tropical northern hemisphere where dinosaurs once roamed was transformed into an ice-covered wasteland. 
like a spinning toy top that starts to slow, the Earth began to wobble. Today, scientists call this wobble the Chandler wobble. The deadly collision wiped out the entire civilization and technology on Venus. The only survivors were 12 space-bound astronauts whose crippled ship crash-landed in the Atlantic Ocean off of Gibraltar on neighboring planet Earth. The astronauts found themselves cast back into the Stone Age with the daunting task of rebuilding their civilization and reinventing science. Like Leonardo da Vinci, masterpiece artist Sandro Botticelli was a member of the secret Priori of Zion Brotherhood. Like da Vinci, Botticelli coded and hid secret knowledge about our human origins into his work. In his painting, The Birth of Venus, Botticelli features the goddess Venus, who is the symbol of planet Venus. The half shell that she's standing in represents the shell-shaped spacecraft that landed in the ocean and was pushed ashore by the winds, which are illustrated at the left of the painting as angelic beings. Greek myth describes how Venus was born from the foam in the sea and taken ashore at Cyprus in the eastern Mediterranean. Cyprus in the eastern Mediterranean is precisely where the sunken island of Atlantis is located, says American researcher Robert Saramast. On a six-day sea voyage, Saramast and his crew scanned the Mediterranean seabed 80 kilometers southeast of Cyprus using sonar imaging technology. They found the Acropolis and massive man-made structures that match Plato's description of Atlantis. Geologists who have studied the Mediterranean's layers of salt deposits claim that the Mediterranean Sea has dried up at least five or six times since antiquity. Today, all that remains of the sunken paradise island of Atlantis is a mountaintop, which we see today as the island of Cyprus. Mount Olympus stands today exactly where it stood in the Mediterranean dry bread when it was home to the Olympic gods from Venus. The Garden of Eden was not a mythical paradise. It was the fertile plain of Atlantis located in the Mediterranean dry bed. The word Eden comes from the Sumerian word meaning plain. Plato described Atlantis as a flourishing civilization populated by humans, gods, and demigods. Beyond the city lay a fertile plain 330 miles long surrounded by majestic mountains dotted with villages, lakes, rivers, and meadows. The idea that flesh and blood, walking, talking gods, live side by side with ancient humans is hard to swallow for some. Why? Because for thousands of years, we've been deeply indoctrinated with the religious belief in the existence of only one invisible, all-powerful God. For the Sumerians, cohabitation with human-like gods was an everyday reality. Greek mythology is really the disguised history of the ancient astronauts of Atlantis, who are described by the ancients as heavy, muscular, eight-foot-tall giants. They traveled at wondrous speeds and possessed immense weapons and supernatural powers, including the power to change frequencies and to appear and disappear. They loved, they sinned, they fought battles, and they had lifespans of hundreds of thousands of years. According to the Vedas of ancient India, the gods were all members of one large but not necessarily peaceful family. Rivalries between family members split up the gods into two warring factions, the young Olympian gods and the older generation of Titan gods. After a fierce ten-year battle, the Olympians, led by Zeus and Poseidon, overthrew the Titans. Zeus seized the throne of power, but his younger half-brother Poseidon challenged his authority. To end the conflict, Zeus and Poseidon drew lots and divided the world between them. Poseidon, the serpent god, would rule Atlantis and the Atlantic region. Zeus would rule Lemuria and the Pacific region. The story of how the gods created humans is found in the Atrahasis epic written in the 18th century BC. 
The epic was written on clay tablets and describes the toil of the lower gods digging canals and rebuilding a new civilization. After 3,600 years of hard labor, they threw down their tools and rebelled. The Council of Higher Gods met and decided that a slave race would be genetically engineered to do the labor for them. Enki was the Sumerian equivalent of the Greek god Poseidon and conducted experiments with the most advanced species on Earth, apes and monkeys. The first hybrid slaves can be dated to around 200,000 BC when Neanderthals first appeared on planet Earth. Neanderthals made their home in Gibraltar, where the remains have been discovered at five different sites. Unfortunately, the experimental Neanderthals proved to be far too aggressive a species and were driven to extinction 25,000 years ago. With further experimentation, the gods genetically engineered Cro-Magnon men, followed by a more docile and manageable race of divine monkeys, the Homo sapiens. For the past few decades, molecular biologists have been examining and mapping human DNA, which has 35,000 genes consisting of over 3 billion chemical bases. It turns out that 97% of our DNA is junk DNA with no known use or function. Failing any other explanation for this shocking revelation, scientists are now considering the notion that our genetic code was written by an extraterrestrial programmer who wrote two versions of our genetic code, a big code and a basic code. Our so-called junk DNA is a hidden and dormant upgrade of our basic code. It is a clever, self-organizing, auto-executing, auto-developing, and auto-correcting software with a built-in connection to the ageless energy and wisdom of the universe. In other words, the DNA that scientists are calling junk DNA is really divine DNA. The facts show that our genetic programmer purposely disabled the big code and left us to exist on only 3% of our DNA. Like a broken radio dial which is stuck on one station instead of roaming across thousands of stations and frequencies, humans are stuck on one station called Five Sense Reality. Genesis, which means origin, is the name of the first book of the Bible. The true origin of the human race is coded right into the very word itself. Genesis is gene Isis, the gene of Isis. Since Isis and Venus are one and the same goddess, the gene of Isis is actually the gene of Venus. The genesis of the human race is the gene of the gods of Venus. Human DNA is 99% identical to the DNA of chimpanzees. Unlike monkeys and other species who live in harmony with Earth's ecosystem, humans are at odds and out of step with nature. Why? Because part of us is foreign to this planet, and it is that foreign part of us that has brought the entire planet and all of its creatures to near extinction. According to Plato, the serpent god Poseidon was so pleased with the human hybrids he had engineered that he mated with a chosen female named Clito and built a palace for her at the top of a hill near the center of the island. He surrounded it with rings of water and land to protect her. Clito gave birth to five sets of twin boys. Eventually, he divided Atlantis into ten districts, each ruled by one of his ten demigod sons. For generations, humans lived among the gods and demigods and multiplied in great numbers. They lived simple, virtuous lives as laborers, but slowly they began to change as greed, power, and sexual immorality corrupted them. To determine a suitable punishment, Zeus gathered the assembly of gods together. In the Sumerian accounts, the gods decreed that a flood would sweep over the cult centers and destroy the corrupt seed of humans and demigods. Poseidon was sworn to secrecy about the plan. When the gods opened the floodgates of the Straits of Gibraltar, 
and allowed the Atlantic waters to come thundering through into the Mediterranean, Atlantis was a doomed paradise. 72,000 references to the flood are found in ancient writings from all over the world. Tablet 3 of the Atrahasis epic describes what happened next. In violation of his oath of secrecy, Poseidon warned Noah of the coming flood that would destroy humanity. He instructed him to dismantle his house, build a roof on it, and seal the upper and lower deck shut with bitumen. Why did Poseidon break his oath of secrecy and warn Noah? According to Genesis, Noah was 600 years old at the time of the flood, indicating that Noah was a demigod and therefore the offspring of Poseidon. After seven days, the flood waters subsided and Atlantis was forever lost beneath the sea. When Zeus learned that Noah had survived the flood, he decided to make a pact with him. In return for Noah's oath to worship and obey him above all other gods, he promised to spare his life. Noah agreed, but secretly his loyalty and the loyalty of his descendants from Abraham through to Queen Elizabeth II have always been to the serpent god Poseidon. There is no possession more prized to the royal families of Europe than their genealogy charts. They treasure them above all else. The charts are their pedigree papers, which trace their royal bloodlines back to their divine roots. Over the millennia, the royal families have preserved the purity and divine powers of their bloodline by interbreeding exclusively within royal power circles. Stories have been surfacing for years about the evil that lurks behind the smiling faces of the royal family of England and the United Kingdom. One rumor that won't go away is that Queen Elizabeth II is an alien. She is thought to have type O RH negative blood, which is believed to be the bloodline of the alien Anunnaki race. The March 18, 1985 issue of Time magazine confirmed that Prince Charles' blood type is, in fact, O RH negative. Have you ever wondered why hemophilia is called a royal disease? The disease is caused by mixing the iron-based hemoglobin of humans with the copper-based blood of royals. Since the two don't mix, laws were introduced to ban marriages between royals and commoners. Everyone knows that copper turns bluish-green when it oxidizes, which is why the copper-based blood of royalty is rumored to be blue in color. One doesn't have to look far to find symbols of the divine worship and ancestry of the royal blue bloods. The British royal family's gold carriage features the giant-sized ancestral serpent god Poseidon riding on the back of it, adorned in gold and carrying a trident. It's no coincidence that the trident carried by the serpent god Poseidon is also carried by Satan. A red serpent is clearly displayed on Prince Charles' coat of arms. Opposite the serpent is Charles' badge as their heir apparent to the British throne. It consists of three ostrich feathers surrounded by a crown with the motto, Ich Dien. The meaning of Ich Dien is, I serve, in German. The motto and ostrich feathers are associated with the Black Prince, who is the son of Edward III. Reading the motto and symbols on Charles' coat of arms from right to left, the following message is conveyed. Ich, I, the Black Prince, serve the Red Dragon. From the Sumerians, Hebrews, Greeks, and other cultures, we learn that the gods created humans in their own image. The Hebrew God of the Bible is called Elohim, which means more than one God. He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What exactly is the image of the gods? In all of the ancient literature, the gods are described as having supernatural powers, advanced knowledge, and advanced technology. But what do we really know about their character? They are described with a dual nature, and their dark side is chilling. They are competitive, terrorizing, vengeful, punishing, power-hungry, egotistical, 
jealous, murderous, selfish, conniving, and bloodthirsty. And they are willing to sacrifice parents, children, siblings, and anything that moves for the throne of power. The Hebrew God of the Bible admits to being a jealous God and warns humans that if they are foolish enough to put any other God before him, he will destroy them. He has a pathological need to be worshipped by humans through animal and even human sacrifice. In Numbers 25, he kills 24,000 of his people with a plague. He views humans who he created in his own image as evil, flawed, and sinful, and demands that they remain ignorant. His first commandment is, thou shalt not know. Finally, he seeks to destroy his sinful human creations in a flood, but shows his ineptitude when they manage to survive. There is no reason whatsoever to doubt the truth of the ancient Sumerian records which describe human-like gods living and walking side by side with humans. Nor is there any reason to doubt similar evidence from the Hebrews, ancient Mayans, Phoenicians, Chaldeans, Aztecs, Aryans, Assyrians, Greeks, and the inhabitants of ancient India and Tibet. At our present stage in human history, we have overpopulated the planet and fulfilled the original purpose we were created for, to rebuild the lost civilization and technology of the gods who claimed this planet as their own 250,000 years ago. If we are to escape the same fate that befell the Neanderthals and our other experimental predecessors, our best hope for survival is to crack our genetic code and activate the power of our divine DNA. Dr. Hammer, a molecular geneticist, claims he has identified the God gene in human DNA. It's called VMAT2, and its job is to release the feel-good chemicals in our body called dopamine and serotonin, which give us the experience of bliss. VMAT2 is the DNA gene of our pineal gland. What's the pineal gland? It's a gland about the size of a raisin located between our eyebrows and directly behind our eyes, right smack in the middle of our cranium. It's called the pineal gland because it resembles a tiny pine cone. This powerful gland is believed to be the seat of our soul and the gateway to the universe and higher realms. Because its structure is remarkably similar to our eyeballs, it's called the third eye or the mind's eye. It actually has a lens, cornea, and retina. The blue bloods revere it. They call it the all-seeing eye and have featured it on the US $1 bill. Strangely, our pineal gland, which is tucked away in the dark recesses of our brain, is bioluminescent and sensitive to light. Like a cell phone, it has a built-in wireless transmitter and is the connecting link between the physical and spiritual worlds and higher frequencies. By awakening our pineal gland, we can speed up our learning and memory abilities, enhance our intuition, wisdom, and creativity, trigger our psychic healing abilities, and experience bliss. The symbol of this pine cone-shaped gland is the pine cone. It is so revered by the Vatican that a special court was built called the Court of the Pine Cone, where the symbol of the world's largest pineal gland is on display. The symbol is also found on the staff of the Pope and the Egyptian god Osiris. Considering the power and function of the pineal gland, why has it been ignored and given so little mainstream attention? Why? Because it's our power source and the ruling families know this. Medical science refers to the pineal gland as the atrophied third eye. By the age of 12, it is already calcified and hardened, and by adulthood, it is dormant and atrophied from lack of use. Recent research reveals that fluoride, which is a toxic additive to our water supply and toothpaste, accumulates in the pineal gland where it wreaks havoc. Outdoor activities, eating less sugar, and eliminating processed foods and fluoride from our diet can help to revitalize it. There is an ancient technique 
that has been preserved and passed down through the centuries for reactivating the pineal gland. The technique produces the same results that Tibetan monks achieve through trance meditation. This exercise technique should not be attempted by anyone who does not feel ready to explore higher realms of consciousness beyond the five senses. To begin the exercise, you need to find the right vibrational tone of voice. Hum the word love, not in a low or high-pitched voice, but somewhere in between. When you find the right tone, it will feel right. Sit comfortably with your back straight and your eyes closed and scan your body for any sign of tension. Take three long, deep breaths through your nose and exhale all the tension through your mouth. Now think about opening your third eye and entering a loving universe where all that exists is bliss. Take another deep breath through your nose and hold it for a few seconds. Just before you exhale, purse your lips and place your tongue between your teeth. Press down gently on your tongue with your teeth. As you slowly exhale through your pursed lips, loudly hum the word love and vibrate the V sound until all of the air is expelled from your lungs. Repeat this exercise four more times, taking a few moments rest between each repetition. To awaken your pineal gland, you need to repeat this exercise again for two more days in a row at 24 hours apart. The entire exercise only has to be done once to be effective. It may take six weeks or more to experience your newly awakened abilities. On our road to self-discovery, we need to ask ourselves the right questions along the way. Questions like, what if we succeed in switching on our God gene? What if we manage to crack our human genetic code and awaken the 97% of our DNA that scientists call junk? What then? The answer may come as a big surprise. We may discover that the monkey in us is the best part of us.